Okay, moving along quickly. Although, of course, I can talk as long as I want because I'm the last one. Okay, let me talk a little bit about what forensic psychology has to offer to uh, a libertarian or, or to anyone concerned with freedom. Uh, there's some important insights uh, that have implications for the judicial system and, and thus for individual rights and liberties. Um, eyewitness testimony. How many of you know how incredibly unreliable eyewitness testimony is? A lot of you know that, but a lot of the, the judicial system depends very heavily on eyewitness testimony. People have been convicted of murder on the basis of faulty eyewitness testimony alone, just on that. Elizabeth Loftus is a cognitive psychologist whose specialty is the unreliability of eyewitness testimony. She's shown over and over again that people can't remember correctly. And yet our judicial system relies very heavily on it. Most jurors will be impressed by eyewitness testimony. And lots of people get wrongly convicted because of uh, faulty eyewitness testimony. And by the way, that has enormous implications for the death penalty, folks. Okay, the next one, the polygraph or lie detector. Another incredibly unreliable instrument. Police are obsessed with it, but it is in mo a lot of courts it's not allowed as testimony for a, good, for a good reason. But the police still rely on it. They think it works. A series of street, three studies found 45% false positive. That means 45% of the people who were telling the truth were seen as lying on the basis of the polygraph test. And the false negative, that is people who were um, lying but weren't caught or weren't, didn't show up as lying on the, on the polygraph, 20%, okay? So to the extent that our judicial system relies on that, um, we've got a problem. People have been convicted of murder on the basis of the polygraph test, uh, a faulty conviction, because they were not guilty. So that's pretty scary. And the important implication, which by the way, I discuss in my book, which I hope you'll all buy, even though I'm not talking about my book, Standing Up to Experts and Authorities. I have a chapter that includes a discussion of how to deal effectively with the police. And of course, the first thing is you don't have attitude. Hello. Uh-uh. But I'm certainly not the only one saying this, but because uh, you could find some really good stuff on YouTube about don't talk to the police. If you, th you, know, if you think, you, if there's even the slightest suspicion that you th they think you might be guilty, shut up and get your lawyer. They will not read you your Miranda rights until they're ready to arrest you. And you know what they do? And this isn't conspiracy theory because it's in one of my forensic psychology books. I, I actually taught forensic psychology. They wait, they wait as long as they can sometimes to arrest you in spite of what you see on television because they don't have to read you your Miranda rights until they're actually willing to arrest you. And people blab, people blab. And people have been wrongly convicted of murder because they blabbed to the police. And the police totally misinterpreted what they said. There's also a book I recommend in my Standing Up to Experts and Authorities book called The Criminal Law Handbook that will tell you the same thing, written by two um, lawyers, uh, published by Nolo Press. How many of you know about Nolo Press? Wonderful self-help legal books. And they tell you, don't talk to the police. And the, okay, and the other implication is never submit to a polygraph test. Unless, of course, you've seen Michael Shermer's video on YouTube on how to beat a lie detector test. He has a, he, yeah, so he, uh, many of you probably heard Michael Shermer speak uh, earlier. He has a great video. I used to show it in my forensic psychology class. Okay, the third piece of research in forensic psychology that has important implications is the work on the death penalty. 
Craig Haney and others have done a lot of work, and what they have found is, for instance, um, be because we now have the, the death penalty, those people opposed to the death penalty are screened out in murder cases. So what you so you only get the people are, who are in favor of the death penalty. That leads to an unrepresentative sample, of, and people the people who are in favor of the death penalty are more likely to convict. Period, <laughs> and sometimes regardless of the evidence. Um, the other thing that Haney uh, and his book is called Death by Design. It's on my reading list. He's found that jurors do not understand the instructions at the sentencing of the death penalty. Uh, for, for example, they don't understand the concept of mitigating circumstances. Um, that is, there might be reasons that might explain why, why the person did what they did that might make a difference in what you might want to sentence them to. They don't understand really about that. And they do not understand that life without the possibility of parole means exactly that. They think, we gotta keep these bad guys off the streets, we gotta sentence them to death, because otherwise some uh, you know, liberal bleeding hearts will just let them out. No, if it's life without the possibility of parole, the only way you get out is if you're proven innocent by independent evidence or maybe an act of Congress. But you don't get out because, from the parole board. But jurors don't understand that. And so all of those things are pretty scary because if any of you have any illusions about the death penalty, innocent people, I have no doubt, and there are other people who know more about this than I do, that innocent people have died. And innocent people will continue to die. And if any of you think that's okay, maybe I'm gonna shun you, like Molino <laughs> mentioned earlier. I don't think it's worth it to have the death penalty when innocent people will die. I, you know, okay, as long as they're in jail, life without the possibility of parole, at least they have a chance to prove their innocence. But if they're dead, it's a little too late. Okay. So the Haney research shows that people buy into the media and cultural myths about crime. Watch too many TV shows. Oh. Uh, people believe that capital punishment is necessary for public safety without understanding how the system really works. And here's a quote from Haney, who, by the way, was one of Mil uh, Zimbardo's graduate students. He participated in the famous Stanford prison study. The flaws that riddle the system combine and operate in tandem. They help enable people to... Uh, uh, Behave, uh, take uh, uh, actions uh, about the life of, of another that many of these w people would otherwise reject and resist. Okay, so I think that's a very important piece of research. So that's, um, and again, I want to mention, I'm going to give a shameless plug for my book, uh, some of this, particularly the forensic stuff, is in my book, because my, my book is a pr um, standing up to experts and authorities is a practical application of psychology. Imagine that, a libertarian being practical. I mean, a practical book. No, I'm kidding. Um, and it, because it, it includes that discussion, eyewitness testimony and uh, lie detector and so forth. And I have many other applications of psychology in the book. It's a practical book about how to deal effectively with uh, experts and authorities in a variety of areas. Uh, bosses, doctors, lawyers, contractors, police, teachers. Very practical book. And by the way, if you all think you know how to do it, you don't. I've been studying resistance all my life, and I learned a lot in doing the research for this book. So, um, anyway. Okay, so now I'm, I'm getting ready to conclude here. We as libertarians need to think about how to implement and encourage personal autonomy, individualism, critical thinking, critical thinking about authority, empathy, moral inclusion, and moral values. Each of us in our own way, whether it's 
on a personal level with our families and friends, maybe with our colleagues if in the schools, either as teachers or as parents who go to the PTA, um, critical, uh, encourage critical uh, thinking programs, values education programs. And by the way, uh, there is, uh, how many of you know about the Foundation for Critical Thinking? So you really got to go to RIT because we've got all this information there. Foundation for Critical Thinking at Sonoma State University has a whole program and books on how to encourage critical thinking in children and so forth. We need to find uh, ways on a community level to encourage uh, private social services that encourage uh, increased autonomy, increased personal responsibility, moral inclusion. Um, and on a political level, we have to have an overt advocacy of individualism, autonomy, personal responsibility, moral inclusion, and f find more ways to apply them on a political level. I can't give you all the answers in a short speech. You've got to figure out some of the answers yourself, but we each need to dedicate ourselves to encouraging these qualities wherever and however we can. We need to create and encourage what I call psychological laissez-faire as well as economic and political. They are all intertwined. If we want to work toward a true libertopia, we need all three. Okay, I'm, I'm just kind of guessing here, but I think we have time for questions. <laughs> yeah. Um, I have a couple of questions that relate to uh, Professor Milgram's uh, experiments. The second one I'll ask you Monday night if Carl has questions. Okay. Uh, but the first one has to do with not, people are not willing, or people are willing not merely to punish others based upon on, on social pressure. But we have the phenomenon of false confessions. They're actually willing to condemn themselves when they know they're innocent based upon social pressure. Well, yeah, uh, the false confession uh, issue is as strange as it seems. I'll just know that. But people will actually confess to crimes they haven't committed. Um, some of it is because of pressure from the police. Um, maybe they somehow feel they're going to, you know, if they don't confess, it's going to be worse for them. Uh, some people are just wackos and will confess to anything. There's a number of different reasons, but the false confession thing is very real. And it is discussed in forensic psychology textbooks. Now, uh, I'm not sure exactly how that ties in to Milgram, um, because the people in the Milgram experiment didn't re re think of themselves as doing anything wrong, uh, really, uh, until they were kind of confronted with it later. But uh, the Milgram experiment has a lot of interesting things to offer us. And if I highly recommend that book, which, of course, is on the reading list. Yeah. Are you familiar with the work of Byron Katie? Psychological life and fair. Okay, well, send me the, uh, the, the name of the book via email um, and, or Facebook. And uh, how many of you are on Facebook? How many of you are on my personal Facebook list? Why aren't you? <laughs> Okay, just send me an invitation. Say you, you, I told you to do it at, at Libertopia. No, but I would be very interested in knowing about that. Um, by the way, I make a distinction between pop psych and popular psychology. Pop psych is the woo-woo stuff and stuff that 
they pull off the top of their head or possibly other orifices. <laughs> and that isn't evidence-based. Like men are from Mars, women are from Venus. Don't get me started on that one. Or The Answer by Rhoda Burns. Oh, please. No, that's pop psych. Popular psychology is evidence-based. Carol Tavris, The Miss Major Woman, excellent book. Other books that I've got on the list. So you can write a popular psychology book without doing the woo-woo stuff. Just do you have a bibliography and citations? Even in my popular, my applied book, I have citations out the wazoo because I didn't pull it off the top of my head or somewhere else. It's based on research or on observations of what actually works for other people. So, um, so I'd like to think mine is popular psychology, not pop psych. Okay, other questions out there? I'm blinded by the light here and not in the Bruce Springsteen sense. Oh, uh, here, I roll there for you. Okay. Um, for someone who's a little more right brain, I'm not very, I appreciate science, but I'm not terribly science minded. What's a good book to start with uh, for learning some <coughs> principles of psychology? Oh, <laughs> well, there are some good intro psychology books. I don't know if that's too much. I mean, see, because uh, uh, there's, because the intro psychology books, because you can kind of skip around and read the chapters you want, because they'll give you a, a whole flavor of all the various areas of psychology. If you wanted to go that route, far and away, the best one is Wade and Tavris, Carol Wade and Carol Tavris, because they write very well, it's very engaging, it's not too hard, I mean, it's substantive, but it's, it's engaging. Um, so, well, no, my book is not a psych, it's not a psychology textbook, it's applied. It's ha how to, you know, deal with authorities. Uh, so it's, it's a, m a little more specific uh, area. So uh, that, that would actually be my recommendation, uh, and you can, you can get them cheap on Amazon. Any edition will be fine. So go back to uh, an, uh, an older edition that won't charge you too much. Okay. Are you saying that there's no room for like an a prioristic method in psychology? I'm sorry. Are you saying there's no room for like an a prioristic method in psychology? Give me an example. It has to be experimental. Like you can't take um like you can't take any case to actually and I can absolutely and you go go on to that and absolutely funniness, but you may have well, okay. Ex okay, she's asking about a priori research and does it have to be experimental research? No, it doesn't. Have, I don't do experimental research. I do survey research. But in order, if we want to talk about proof and you know evidence that something actually works, we have to have some system. And, but it doesn't have to be an experiment. That's the strongest method. But many things don't lend themselves to experiments. Uh, and we have to have an ecle eclectic uh, approach. But the best, I mean, you know, psychology, contrary to what economists think, actually uses the scientific method. And that means that we have to look at the research in a some kind of control way. It doesn't have to be experimental. But you have to have a comparison group, you know, um, and, that, and that you don't have to do that, but that, that would be a good way. That's what I did. I looked at political resistors versus non-resistors and looked at the difference. I mean, that's the kind of way we do it in psychology. But I'm not going to say it's the only way, because interview research, um, uh, ideographic research is the fancy term. Lens gives us many insights that can then be tested by other means. So I'm not snitty and kind of narrow about what kind of research uh, will, will help us. There, there's a lot of different methods in psychology. When I referred to the woo-woo stuff, I was talking about the stuff where people just make it up and don't have any kind of evidence to back it up. It's just their personal pet theories. And in, for instance, in uh, 
men are from Mars, women are from Venus. There, were actually, so, there is actually research that speaks to that question. But because John Gray has no bibliography in his book, you have no way of knowing what is actually evidence-based and what he pulled off the top of his head or elsewhere. Uh, so, but, but I'm, I'm not going to rule out a variety of different methods that might be helpful. But ultimately, evidence, I mean, hypotheses have to be tested using the scientific method. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, do you have any advice on how to handle a psychological bully? Well, uh, yeah, actually I talk about that in two different chapters in my book. See, it's a practical book. Please buy it. Um, what, what doesn't work... Okay, only question. Oh, what was the question? He, he asked, oh, do you have any advice on how to handle a psychological bully? And that's a big problem, by the way. There's a lot more of that going on than people realize, both in the schools and in the workplace. And here's the deal. Bullies look for people who are weak, people who will just kind of keel over and, you know, so you stand up to them, but not by fighting, not by aggression. You say, leave me alone. And in the school setting, that's a little tricky, but what what the experts, and you know, I didn't make this, the, my book up, uh, you know, I relied on other experts who were evidence-based, okay. Um, in a school setting, you've got to go tell the teacher, tell the principal, this bullying is going on. And bullying's a big problem in schools. And you get, well, of course, you have to gather evidence. And whether it's in the workplace, I mean, if you're going to do a report, the first thing that you do is you stand up to it yourself, and then they'll, they'll look for somebody who's easier pickings. Um, or uh, then, but if that doesn't work, then you have to go uh, uh, up the chain of command at work or up the chain of command at school, and you have to make it clear to them that you're not going to put up with it especially in the schools, because the principals are, the schools are notorious. They, they don't want to, they're cowards. They don't want to deal with bullying. And um, I, I go into more specific detail about things you can do in uh, both a school and uh, workplace setting. But there are, as far as the workplace setting, there's a, there's a couple of really terrific websites that go into more specific information on how to deal with bullies in the workplace. And I talk about that a lot, actually, in the book. And by the way, the book, my book also has a lot of uh, recommended reading and recommended websites. Also relatives, you talk about uh, bullying by relatives? No, I actually don't talk about that in this book. But, and that, of course, in a way, is a little trickier. But the main thing is you can't put up with it. Um, uh, yeah, I, let, me, let me move on to some other questions here. Standing up to experts and authorities. Yeah. In the far as the school setting, uh, reporting the bully to the teacher or the principal, the teacher or principal, the government schools are bullying themselves. Well, they can be. They're not always. Um, yeah, the, and then, then you might want to... Okay, here's what you do. You, you mention that you're going to go to the superintendent of schools with the problem. Or you I tell you, getting the media involved can be your friend. Let me tell you about my favorite example of how getting, get, going to the media helped. This is actually it's a specific kind of bullying. It's sexual harassment. Uh, two t uh, teachers, two lecturers at Cal State Northridge went into the office of uh, one of the professors who was up for tenure. And folks, he dropped his pants. And I'm pretty sure there was never any time when that is appropriate <laughs> on campus. Now, he admitted to it, but he said, oh, we just play rough in this department. Well, obviously, they didn't think it was appropriate because they filed a suit. And the department didn't want to hear it. 
the uh, dean of their school didn't want to hear it. The president of Cal State Northridge didn't want to hear it because, you know, they were lowly peon lecturers and their, the guy was a darling boy about to get tenure. So, but he really screwed up big time because they were members of the California Faculty Association. They were activists. They went to the LA Times. He did not get tenure. They won. Okay, the media can be your friend. We're very much aware of how the media can be our enemy, but the media can be your friend. They like your story. Yeah. Considering the so much valuable insight that we gained from the Milgram and Stanford prison experiments, and my understanding is that those experiments would never be allowed to uh, be undertaken today. Does that mean that we're missing out on a lot of valuable insight into psychology? Okay, that's an excellent question. He, uh, he pointed out that the Milgram and Zimbardo experiments couldn't be done, replicated in toto today because they, are, um, they wouldn't get past the ethics committee because people were upset at the results. And we, we are, our responsibility is, I mean, I'm sorry, the people in the experiment were psychologically distraught. Uh, uh, it, well, it was more true in, in the Zimbardo than the Milgram. And that, that violates our responsibility as psychologists, that is, to do no harm. Um, that's true. Uh, re full replications would not get past the Ethics Committee. But here's how the professor, Jerry Berger, at Santa Clara University got past that problem. He did, a par, uh, he did a replication up to 100, okay, uh, I, I know some of you may not be familiar with the Milgram experiment, but what happened is each time the alleged learner, who was really a confederate, made a mistake in remembering some word pairs, he would get shocked and each time it would go up by an increment of 15 volts and they pull a toggle switch. And what Berger did was stop at 180 degrees. Uh, in the original uh, uh, Milgram experiment, the toggle switches went up to 450 volts, danger, severe shock. But he stopped at 180 because he looked at the results of the Milgram experiment, and most people who were going to resist had done so by 180. And, and so when uh, the first time a person complained, they stopped. So it wasn't a full replication, but it got past the ethics committee, and guess what? He found the same thing Milgram did. So there are ways to get around it. Also, there's a replication in France, which is only available to you if you read French, which I struggle through. My French is not that great, but I struggle through it. Um, basically the same thing. And they, have, they apparently have less strict rules in France because it was a little closer to the Milgram um, but there are ways, there are ways to test these things. The real one that can never be replicated in, in, without being really clever is the Zimbardo prison simulation study. The, the, that one was much more stressful for the subjects than what was going on in the Milgram experiment. In fact, uh, Milgram once told Zimbardo, thank God, Phil, now you're taking some of the heat off me. What do you su suggest for students here in college today who are having a lot of different views about what the professors are teaching them? And what do they do with that? I'm sorry, I'm having a hard so time what hearing. What would you do about students in college who have different views about what the professors are teaching them? Ah, I discussed that in my book, too. <laughs> So that depends exactly what's going on. If a professor is basically saying my way or the highway, I'm, I'm gathering that's what you're getting at. Well, if, if, you, if, you, if it's appropriate to present a different point of view, you must do it in a respectful way. If you're aggressive and in your face, you'll never get anywhere with a professor. Um, if you feel that the professor has done, really stepped over a line, and that does happen, 
because, um, I mean, it's one thing to have the professor say something you disagree with. Well, grow up. It happens all the time. But if they step over the line and say something really outrageous, then it does happen. I had a professor back at Cal who, uh, this was during the Goldwater time. Whoops, I've given away my age, haven't I? Um, said, Goldwater's insane, uh, you know, blah, 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 you know. If they step over a line, then you go to the chair of the department and say, I, I feel this is inappropriate. Now, maybe the chair will do something, maybe they won't, but that's what you have to go up the chain of command. It depends on how outrageous the professor is, how far up the line you go. It, does that help? Uh, I have maybe, or, you, you know, you might, if it's, you might go in a, to the professor's office hours and say, I feel a little uncomfortable when you say X. I mean, that's just a standard communication text. And, if, and then you look, you start with that. You don't start by complaining to the chair. Well, actually, it may depend on how outrageous they are. You might want to start with complaining to the chair. But um, sometimes there, there can be misunderstanding. And the, uh, I, I once had a student approach me. One of her, she was a Muslim who wore a headscarf. And one of her professors said something that she found offensive. And she was afraid to confront the professor directly. As it turned out, that particular professor was not somebody who steps over the line. She's a really nice person. So I, uh, actually, I spoke to the uh, professor on their behalf. So that's another, another method, go to a sympathetic professor. There's lots of different ways, and it depends on the individual situation.